I beg you to try it, Patricio. Let me get this straight, Carla. You disagree on the weapon, you disagree on the number of blows. <laughs> Listen to me, Patricio. You were there once in your life. Hi, people. Trish Wood here. And this is the Trish Wood is Critical podcast. This is a show where I'm drawing quite a bit on some very, very old journalistic experience I got covering some of the big environmental disasters around the world. I was at Love Canal uh, just outside of Niagara Falls. I was at the Hanford Reservation in Washington State that was suffering from radiation leakage from the reactors that made the plutonium for the Hiroshima bomb. That was a big disaster. And I was at the Exxon Valdez up in Prince William Sound. I've been through a bit of these things, and I will tell you that my hair was standing on end over what is happening in East Palestine in Ohio. So we are going to talk about that today. What a disaster. I will say that a phrase came to mind when I saw what they'd done, not just the derailment with the toxic chemicals, but then this absurd burn they did that nobody can really seem to explain why and who gave the order for it. We're going to get into that too. The phrase that came to mind for me was one they coined about Love Canal, which was at the time the largest environmental disaster ever in the United States. Love Canal was a community that had been built over top of some discarded hooker many, 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 many millions of tons of hooker chemicals that had been ditched in the area. And they built a house, a, a neighborhood over it with houses and people and children. And um, the chemicals started leaching into the basements of the houses and causing all kinds of health problems and and uh, terror in the people who were led out of the predicament by a young woman I knew whose name was Lois Gibbs. And she started the Love Canal Homeowners Association and they made history. They made a movie about her. The phrase they used about Love Canal was that it was a sacrifice zone that it was so contaminated, terribly, terribly dangerous, they had to sacrifice it and no one could live there ever again. So they bought the homeowners out and they moved on. And um, ironically, once they had contained the leakage and done some more remedial work, they allowed people to move back. Everybody's always looking for a cheap house, right? And uh, it was all hunky-dory until a few years ago. And then they started having some similar problems. <sighs> Maybe they should have left it sacrificed. But uh, I'm just going to play you a little bit of the initial news coverage of Love Canal. From 1947 until 1952, the Hooker Chemical Company used the Love Canal section of Niagara Falls as a dumping site for toxic waste. President Carter declared a state of emergency today in the Love Canal area of New York's Niagara Falls, where toxic chemicals were discovered oozing from the ground. That discovery in a Niagara Falls neighborhood triggered an environmental battle that played out on national television and became one of the most iconic in U.S. history. We want out! We want out! After the federal government finally evacuated hundreds of families, new laws were introduced to prevent future love canals. Occidental Chemical Company agreed to pay $129 million. My three kids were born with birth defects. My wife's had cancer. More than three decades later, what happened to residents exposed to these chemicals? And what happened to the place that came to symbolize the nightmare of toxic waste in America? So that, that's just some of the historical news footage that came out of the Love Canal catastrophe that happened just outside of Niagara Falls, New York. And um, it, East Palestine does feel like it might be going in that direction. It looks like the contamination has gone far and wide. Animals are dying. The water looks strange. People are feeling sick. And here's what's new, uh, which is to say different than Love Canal. Love Canal ended up getting a fair bit of attention in the news. And it did take, gosh, nearly two weeks for legacy media and the agencies that should be protecting these people in Washington to pay attention to it. It was Tucker Carlson who broke through and um, everybody else was just sort of 
not really, not really paying attention to it, not really covering it. And you have to wonder, East Palestine is a very, very poor town. It's a Trump town full of Trump voters, poor people. I'm sure they have an opioid crisis problem there. This, these are the hollowed out communities of flyover America that no one cares about. Uh, Norfolk Southern was the railroad that jumped off the tracks and carrying all of these hazardous chemicals in 10 tanker cars, which somebody decided they were going to burn off. It's a ridiculous, ridiculous idea. And um, it took a very long time for people to pay attention. But even though they seem to be paying attention now, it is not looking good for those people. They need to be bought out. They'll never feel comfortable or safe in those houses again. So we'll see. We'll see if we can get there. On the show today, we're really lucky to have a guy named Sil Caggiano. He is a local. He's from actually uh, Youngstown. He was a fire chief and a hazardous materials specialist down there. And he's the voice that's broken through and is laying out how dangerous is what has happened down there. So we've got him today. And then we have a chap named Ryan Cunningham who is a specialist in hazardous materials also, but also a uh, an expert in crisis management. He's going to weigh in as well and talk about what they should have done and what they, what they didn't do. This is Norfolk Southern, who seemed to be running the operation after the train derailed. I mean, it's remarkable that they were in charge. Where was Pete Buttigieg? Where was he? You know, Mr transportation secretary whose response was to say, well, there's a thousand derailments a year. Really? Then why are you allowing, why are you allowing the transfer of this kind of material on tracks that are deficient in trains that have a terrible braking system, apparently? So he kind of exposed himself there, didn't he? By saying that, (laughs) just bizarre. But I do worry for these poor people. I do. No one is going to care for them, except maybe when the lawyers come in like they did at Love Canal, will they be taken care of? If anybody down there is listening, don't sign anything. If somebody asks you to sign a waiver, don't sign the waiver. Do not sign it. Don't give away your right to sue, because that's how this thing is going to get cleaned up. Uh, Norfolk Southern's chairman or CEO uh, was supposed to show up at a, t- a town hall, and he did not. Uh, he was afraid for his safety. It's just, it's just another exposure of how regular people are not cared for. They're not cared about. There's a two tier system. It also exposes, like COVID did, how inept are the regulatory agencies that are supposed to be taking care of people. They can't get a straight answer about whether or not the water is drinkable, even though their pets are dying and the fish are dying. It's just, it's an absolute shit show. Pardon my French, but it's it's awful. As I've said, I've seen this before, and it'll probably be years before these people get what they deserve, which is if they want it, uh, they should just buy out the whole town at fair market value and let them move. Because uh, this... Contagion seems to have gone far and wide. Water, air, it's in their houses, it's everywhere. I'm not sure it's you can clean it up, right? It's bad. So we've got Sil Caggiano, we've got Ryan Cunningham, and then we've got Denis Rancourt coming up to talk about a couple of really interesting things on the COVID-19 front. Number one is how we should view these studies that are coming out now saying, oh, the vaccine saved millions of lives and, oh, misinformation about COVID killed all these people. And, you know, you look at the studies and they're so badly designed. It's actually laughable. But um, but this is what we live through now, don't we? It's information war. The legacy media dutifully pick up these studies and run with them to vindicate the fact that they were completely behind policies that were that were harming people. One of the worst ones is one from the Council of Canadian Academics. That's the one on misinformation. They say killed 2,800 Canadians. It's just gruesome. Denis Rancourt is going to talk about that. He's also going to talk about his own study about the vaccines and how dangerous, in his opinion, they are. 
I don't always agree with everything all my guests say. I'm not sure I agree that it's as dangerous as he says, but I let him make his case about that. And we also have a little bit of a dust up about um, HIV and AIDS, which I covered. He has a different view of it than I do that I wasn't expecting to talk to him about today, but we did. And so you can hear that. And we did it politely. That's where we should be going these days, being nice to each other, right? Anyway, I'm happy to be giving the East Palestine story uh, some airtime on the show because I feel deeply for these people when they're in these messes. I was at the Hanford Reservation in Washington State where they were having a lot of thyroid cancer, two-headed cows in some of the farms based on radiation leaking from the facilities there. I was at the Exxon Valdez oil spill where the fishermen had to fight like mad and the captain of the boat that hit the Bly Island Reef actually went to jail because he was drunk for causing that big oil spill. I've had a lot of experience with this stuff. And what I can tell you is that people are traumatized by it and it lasts a lifetime. So they need to be taken care of. I will also say that the le- the far left media like Jacobin Magazine and the Socialist Workers Weekly or whatever it's called have been really great on East Palestine. It's so, and and they, the other people have been great has been like Fox News. This is an interesting moment in time where poor people are are abandoned by the centrists and the so-called liberals and the Democrats and even the centrist Republicans to some degree, but they're being they're they're given a voice by the far left, the socialists and the far left progressives who aren't Democrats. <laughs> And Tucker Carlson and conservative, some conservative media. That this is kind of an interesting moment in time on that. So let's do our pitch before we get into the interview with Sil Caggiano. We're funded by our listeners like you, and if you are in any way enjoying what we do, or at least feeling like you're informed by it, please go to our website, which is trishwoodpodcast dot com. And you will find a donate button there. You can do PayPal, you can do Patreon, you can do Substack. We prefer Substack because it's the free speech platform. And um, if you have anything you want to say about the show, you can write to me at info at trishwoodpodcast.com. I do read them all. I don't answer every single one, but I do read them all. And I'm always very, very grateful to see them. And then at the end, as I'm recording this at about two o'clock on Friday, the report on the Emergencies Act is coming out down in Ottawa. Of course, it's a total sellout. (laughs) What did you expect? Um, And I'll make a comment on that at the end of the show. So just to start, here is my interview with Sil, and he's down in Ohio. Hi, Sil, how are you? Good afternoon. How are you doing, Trish? I'm doing really well. So so where are you back home in Youngstown now? Is that where you are? Yeah, that's where I and, live. Uh, that's right. Really cool. of Youngstown. And, and how far is that from East Palestine? Probably about 20 miles away. Is that right? Yeah. So I just want to, first of all, say thank you for doing this. I, I, I've seen you on a couple of, of American uh, broadcasts and, um, I, you know, you're, you're cutting through the kind of nonsense in a way that I think is meaningful. Usually in these events, there's a voice that um, that's kind of breaks through. And I feel right now like yours is the one. Um we talked on the phone briefly just about our own experiences. And I, I talked a little bit about love canal and how the phrase was raised about it being a kind of a sacrifice zone. And I've, I've got this terrible feeling that that is what is going to happen in East Palestine. What do you think, or Palestine, sorry, what do you think? Well, <clears throat> I was the one that coined the phrase, you know, we nuked the town for the, the railroad. Um, I, I think this is going to turn into our own domestic version of a Bhopal, India. Uh, where people were sacrificed for the uh, the might of a railroad, um, and there seems to be some systemic breakdowns that are occurring. Um, noted a lot of divisive politics uh, that are, that is centered more around uh, puff self puffery than actually taking care of these people. Um, it, it just you know it it really really worries me because these people through no fault of their own have become the epicenter for a, a large chemical release um, and, and actions taken uh, uh, you know, to abate that 
that in the 39 years that I've done hazmat and I've been in fire, I've never seen taken. Wow. So, yeah, I, I really do feel that uh, that these people um, are on their way to becoming a historic event. Yeah, that, that I have to tell you, that is absolutely perfectly put. I also am old enough to remember Bhopal. Again, I was working in the news business when when that happened, um, and it was horrifying. But it this does have the outlines of an historic event for me. And um, I'm very, I, I, you know, I'm alternately massively angry and, and massively sad that here we are again. I mean, it's just, it's unthinkable. I have to agree with that. Um, but this is something that's been coming for quite some time. Um, you know, people are saying the left is right, the wrong, the, the right is wrong. Um, the left is wrong. The, the right is wrong. The left is right. The right is right. Now, both sides are, are, are culpable in this, in, in the, uh, the political arena of, of the United States, because this is a can that has been kicked down the road, railroad safety, railroad regulations, instituting modern procedures. Uh, it, it's been kicked down the road till now it's derailed and it seems to be derailing on some regular basis here. Um, you know, not even, not even discussing the incident, you know, the, the the lax le- you know, lax uh, legislative rules about this, uh, you know, we were going to make car make trains like this that haul hazardous materials and install electric brakes. Then that was signed out under the previous administration. Now this administration is not saying anything as to whether they're going to do it or not. You know, you've got, at some point in time you've got to quit looking at the blue and the red. The you know the 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 lobbyists and this see these, these people here you know, this is the end result of, of a uh, a laissez faire attitude to the railroad industry probably going back at least four administrations if not five. Well, it's interesting you'd say that because um, it, just in watching the coverage here um, now I'm I'm seeing that uh, Jacobin magazine has written a, a really good investigative piece. I know you were interviewed by the World so- uh, Socialist Workers site, which is really interesting. How can I be agreeing with those people? But I mean, it's right. Like this is, it is something that should be uniting left and right. But 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 aside from the kind of far progressive left and their investigative journalists and, and Tucker Carlson, who is absolutely on the other side politically, um, the people in the in the kind of cultural middle are the ones who are really kind of, um, you know, uh, taking a Hail Mary pass and not talking about this very much. It's, it's quite interesting. One of the things I read was about this breaking thing, which I think is what you're talking about, which was, I think Obama had the right idea. Trump was lobbied to remove this new kind of, I think, digital breaking or something, right? And yes. then now that now that this has happened, they're 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 blaming Trump, but they've been in office for ever too, and they could have fixed it, and and they didn't. So it's you know the 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 politics of it. I think it crosses all all parties, and it's really a question of rich and poor, in my view. Well, yeah, it crosses all parties, and, and that's why you know some people who know me. They know I'm a very, you know, I'm a big, strong union guy. I used to be a union president. Yeah. Uh, I'm a very liberal indiver- in, individual. And they said, you know, you know, Sil, what are you doing on Fox? What are you doing here? <laughs> the reason why I'm there is because this is something that transgresses left, right, blue, green, you know, white, black. This is, this could happen anywhere. Yeah. It could happen. In, it, it's happened in Detroit now. It's you know, unfortunately not to the you know fortunately not to the the extent as it happened in East Palestine, but what really angers me is I was on a uh, Newsmax program the other night, and they were trying to tout this as a white Trump, uh, you know, town versus the you know the woke agenda of you know the the uh, the, the 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 right and. That's dangerous because what you're doing now is you're now starting to pit people against each other yeah. and make them say that things are not being done. And that just allows Norfolk Southern to say, hey, while you two are fighting, we're going to do what we need to do to take care of ourselves. And that's the focus. Norfolk Southern, these railroad companies, they've been doing what they've needed to do to take care of themselves for years. What, uh, last quarter, billion dollars of profit in Norfolk Southern. Really? 
you know, they've been taking care of themselves very well. And now it's time for them to, you know, belly up to the bar and say, hey, you know, do the mea culpa. And, you know, one of the things I learned when I, be, you know, became a, an incident commander and a chief uh, and through public information, uh, uh, you know, officer school, you tell the truth, you tell it all, you tell it first, and you tell them what that you're going to do to solve the problem. And that doesn't seem to be forthcoming from all of this. Oh, God, no. That's such an interesting thing you just said, because it, it's, uh, it is true in media relations and crisis management that you do, I think they call it the Tylenol rule, because they, they remember when the Tylenol bottles were poisoned and people were dying of it. And the head of Johnson & Johnson got on, went on the Phil Donahue show immediately, and he said, we're fixing it. Yes, it's happening. We don't know how it happened, but we're pulling all of the product where it's never going to happen. It was instantaneous. And I thought, wow, like that's really how you do it. He didn't whinge or moan or whine about being victimized by a crazed poisoner. He, he took responsibility. No one does that anymore. And certainly Norfolk, Norfolk Southern is not doing it now. Well, they, they've been mushrooming just about everybody in this. And that's one of the reasons why I first got involved in this, because the news media in the area who knew me, uh, you know, I've, I've been rather prolific in my, my work. I've been in a couple of documentaries, Rolling Stone magazine. So, you know, and, and they've known me all my, you know, my 39 year career in Youngstown. Yeah. I get phone calls from reporters that I know, Hey, Sil, you know, what's going on here? We're not getting any, any information. How come they don't have any information? And I said, well, after the engineer, if he's still alive, uh, meets the incident commander, the next thing he should be doing is handing him a train consist so they know what was you know, what was in their train. Yeah. I don't know if this happened. It's never been directly answered. And then a few days later, they're saying, still, we're not getting any information about these train cars. So I'm telling news, various news reporters, send me videos, send me pictures. Let me take a look at what you've got. And I started identifying cars vis-a-vis -vis their UNID numbers, uh, you know, ones that were completely obliterated based on their container, uh, you know, container size and construction, possible content. And through the, uh, the rail car numbers themselves, you see on the side of the cars, there's like UTLX, TLX, and there's like a six digit number afterwards. Yeah. There's an app available that you, you know, to incident commanders and chiefs that you can actively ping the American Association of Railroads and get the information there, you know, necessary to do this. And I was the one feeding them the information, which should have been coming from the incident command. And I cite Sarah Title III, which is aptly named Community Right to Know Act, that this has to be disseminated to the people. And you know, the, the media, whether you like them or not, left, right, you know, socialist, communist, they are the people that are supposed to hold truth to power. And they are the conduit for the people to get information. And none of that was coming. And that's how I originally got involved in this. Yes, and I, I remember that because the other thing media is supposed to do is, is they're supposed to hold accountable the people responsible. And there wasn't for two weeks. There was, if you know, honestly, if it wasn't for Tucker Carlson and Fox News, who who occasionally can really knock these things out of the park when they focus on them, I don't think that the response as lackluster as it still seems to be, would have happened at all. I mean, it's it's amazing what's happened over the last kind of four days since since they've been talking about it. So I just want to go back now and just uh, so people fully understand why you were the person I wanted to talk about this. You said, and you mentioned it just a minute ago, that you said the town had been nuked. Why did you say that? What was it that prompted you to use that kind of language about it? Well, there was a, um, a video posted by someone, I think it was in Darlington, Pennsylvania, who was underneath that mushroom cloud that they created when they detonated the chemicals. And there was particulate matter falling into his property from the cloud. And I'm looking at this and I'm saying, you know, my God, I, I'm like watching like a nuclear winter situation, you know, where they, they've nuked half the world and, and there's this fallout. And I'm thinking, well, you know, yeah, we basically did nuke a town, but not with a nuclear weapon, but with chemicals. And because the reason why I said nuked is because when you think of nuke, you think about total contamination of everything everywhere. And, and I'm afraid this is the legacy this, that this town is going to have. And yeah. You know, sure enough, as soon as they thought it was good enough for everybody to come home, 
things had dissipated, the railway, the railroads were running back through, you know, East Palestine again. It was like within days when stuff like this, you have to back off, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the cleanup and recovery phase is not two days. Wow. You have, you have thousands of residents whose homes are there. Okay. You can all come back. And if you think you want to have your house tested, give us a call. That's not the way that goes. You know, and it doesn't breed confidence in the process. You know, you have to explain to these people, again, you go back to tell the truth, tell it all, tell it first and tell them what you're going to do about it. Do you and think that those chemicals were burned the way they were in order to get the railroad open sooner? The only thing I can say for sure is the 39 years that I have been dealing with you know, uh, various assorted hazardous materials incidents, I have never once in any uh, anything that I've seen or anything that I've read heard of them detonating cars uh, and, and blowing up and burning off the product. Never, ever. I've seen them let the product burn off out of the cars. Uh, you know, their excuse was there was a potential blevy um, that may or may, or may or may not have been exacerbated by the removal of, you know, uh, unmonitored hand water lines. What's a blevy? Uh, Sorry, what's a blevy? Blevy is, uh, blevy stands for boiling liquid expanding vapor explosion. Oh. Now, to put it in analogy, if you make tea with one of those teapots that whistle when they start getting the steam, what you're doing is you're making an expanding vapor and that vapor is escaping out of the safety hole in the whistle in the pot. If at some point in time you make more steam than that whistle or you know pop-off valve can handle, the pot will blow. Like Back in the days, you'd hear boilers blowing up and all that other stuff. That's what would have happened. And it would have sent shrapnel, probably took out a few more cars. But you don't know for sure if that was going to happen. Things could have cooled off. But I can tell you what they did was just as bad as that truck or that uh, vehicle bloodling. The only thing that was missing was the shrapnel that would have got sent around. Do we know who uh, made the decision to do the burning? Has that been made clear? Uh, fingers have been pointed in several directions. Uh, Norfolk Southern, uh, the state of Ohio agreed to it. The state of Pennsylvania has agreed to it. Uh, they're saying that the military came up with the plan, um, which which amazes me because the military and the civilians, we, they operate on two separate wavelengths. They they have a thing called acceptable casualties. Yeah. And, and, and in civilian life, we don't. So, you know, they're pointing it in, in many directions. And it's like, well, no. You know, the person that had to ultimately allow their vehicles to be blown up with was Norfolk Southern. You know, someone says, I'm going to solve your I'm going to solve your, uh, you know, your engine problem by blowing your car up. Um, I mean, you have to agree to that. And, and evidently they had to have agreed to it. And from what I understand, uh, DeWine agreed to it. And, you know, the, the governor from Pennsylvania, Shapiro, agreed to it. Now, supposedly, they're all backstepping away and saying, well, we didn't think it was a great idea. Like, no, duh. You know, when when they told me they're going to blow this up, I'm, I was like dumbfounded. Did you know they were going to blow it up before they blew it up? Yeah. I was actually called into the called into the news room at 27 to do color commentary because it was like, you know, no one ever heard of this. And, neither, and I admitted on camera, neither did I. Wow. And when they, you know, they blew it up, it was, you know, it was exactly what I thought was going to happen. Wow. Wow. wow, wow. And so how do you think what, what, I mean, you know, you're a guy who's been around these kind of situations, uh, most of your working life and, um, you know, you're kind of good at the emergency stuff and you're good at the hazmat stuff. What do you think was really, at, I mean, this to me, uh, you know, but this is tw a hindsight 2020, it just seems like an incredibly boneheaded and dangerous thing to do. What do you think they were thinking when they set about exploding those cars? <sighs> the only thing that comes to mind to me is that it took care of the problem very quickly. Now, let's look at this. You know, this may have been a benign thought of how to, how to neutralize the situation. But the end result was if they'd have put the fire out in these cars, none of the product in any one of those cars would have been marketable anymore and would have been hazardous waste. They would have had to open up each container, drain each container into another uh, tanker or something that they could ship to have this waste disposed of. 
And as you will find out, you know, you make a ton of money getting rid of being the person that handles hazardous waste because it is expensive to get rid of. And it's also time consuming to pump off all of these tankers. Yeah. So something that would have, may have took a week or two, within days, things are solved simply by blowing the product up and letting it mushroom cloud over the, uh, the town. That, you know, whether or not that was the intent, that was the end result. And within days, the trains are running through. I told one of the reporters uh, when this started, I said, they will do what they need to do to get their trains running within the shortest amount of time. And that reporter just texted me yesterday and she goes, Sil, you're absolutely right. That's what they're doing. And they don't have the balls to show up and you know, uh, face these people because they're afraid they're going to get beat up. And that's what happened the other night at the, uh, the uh, news conference. They wouldn't show up because they were afraid that their employees were at risk. The same employees, mind you, that are walking the town and taking care of stuff and they haven't been attacked. Now all of a sudden they feel that they go to a, a town hall, they're going to get attacked. But this is the new default position in, in the world we live in, right? Everybody wants a safe zone. And the way you get out of stuff is by saying you don't feel safe. I mean, it's just shocking that he would make that implication. And I have not seen nor read any death threats or anything toward the people have been actually quite, I mean, they're getting more mad by the day because they're tired and scared, but, but they've been relatively subdued, haven't they? They've been desperate, but they haven't been, you know, let's, let's not, you know, let's not mince words here. They're very passionate. Okay. You know, the, yeah. the town hall meetings are very, you know, shouting at people, but let's back off and let's look at what the track record is here. First, it was okay. And then it wasn't okay. Then you were going to evacuate a mile. And after you know, I went into the meeting and said, yeah, a mile ain't enough. You should be looking at about a mile and a half, maybe more. They went to two miles to evacuate. Um, then the water was safe. The water wasn't safe. Everything was okay. You could come back. No, we're going to monitor it. The water isn't safe. Now the water is safe. How do you have confidence in a process that is continuously backpedaling? I mean, you, you can't. And I don't blame these people. You know, the, the, the process to me, there is a failure of command there somewhere. And, you know, things just took a wrong turn. I mean, you, you, you have a unified command under those things, but the unified command still falls under the incident commander. And, you know, and even with the, the press conferences, as soon as the incident commander got mad, press conferences ended. Well, again, that does not breed confidence in the system. That is what got people calling me. Fortunately, they're calling me because a lot of times what media just does is they grab the first person they could find yeah. and, you, you end up hearing about space aliens, you know, coming down there and derailing trains. Yeah. Fortunately, yeah. they had a, a go to, but it, it doesn't, you know, that kind of that kind of uh, command structure does not breed confidence in, in, in the process. And these people are you're, the way these people are feeling about it is the end result. And this guy, I mean, this is one of the things wrong in the world today, that this guy from Norfolk Southern, who makes $4.5 million a year, and takes the billion dollar profits and puts them back into stock buybacks instead of improving safety on his trains, um, is afraid to come into town or saying he's afraid to come into town. That's There is something really kind of in a larger, more global sense wrong that people don't take accountability uh, for what they've done, because it devalues the lives of the people in East Palestine, doesn't it? It, it, it? It's like they're nothing. They're not worth even recognizing by this company. It's just disgusting. Oh, yeah, you know, your company did this. And, and another thing that, that kind of irritates my onions is the governor of Ohio has not declared East Palestine a disaster site yet. What's up with that? What's up with that? I... I, I to the life of me, I don't know. These people need maybe alternate housing and stuff. The only way you're going to do that, the only way you're going to have FEMA come in, the only way that these people are going to get any you know, disaster relief is if he calls it a disaster scene. I do not understand why he has not done that. He looks slightly crazed to me. Like he, he looks like there's something wrong with him. You know, I don't know if it's a guilt or fear of what's happened. I don't understand what he's doing. Well, my whole thing is I fear that the Ohio legislature has, uh, because of the supermajority in the current House and Senate, 
uh, they have went after people like Amy Acton, uh, who said what she thought, and they attacked her for it. They attacked her at her home. What'd she say? Uh, well, with the COVID thing, she said exactly what she thought. Well, that became politically unpopular. Oh, I see. So what I think the wine is doing to stay in favor of the current controlling party in the state of Ohio yeah. is acquiescing to people that won't rock the boat. And a prime example is the, the doctor from the health department who's standing there equiv- trying to equivalate a long-term exposure to volatile organic chemicals from filling your car up to what the people of East Palestine got in a short three-day period. Oh. Two different things. One's chronic, one's acute. Both yeah. of them are bad. Yeah. But, you know, these people, you can see them rolling their eyes because, you know, that that's not the whole thing. And, you know, you, you get the people that come in, oh, yeah, everything's safe. But they don't live there. These people do. You want to build confidence in these people? You really 100% sure that, that uh, you know, everything's okay there? Go there and stay for a while. So, you know, get a, bring in a trailer. Okay. And and stay with these people if you think it's so great. Because the first responders are staying there. These people come in and they say their thing and then they go. Yeah. You know, one of the other representatives from the uh, the house was there. And he was saying, well, you know, people are complaining of rashes, but I've been here and I haven't you know, gotten a rash yet. Well, yeah, go well, live that, there for a little bit. <laughs> and that's scientific, isn't it? Oh, I didn't get a rash. So, I mean, it's just, it's just, it's just, it's completely absurd. Let me ask you this. Um, I just a bit about the science. So what is the most of all of the stuff that it was 10 cars that derailed? Is that correct? Yes. It was a ten, and, and were they all carrying hazmat stuff? Yeah, they're carrying a, 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 um, a whole host of like really bad stuff. Uh, if yeah. you want me to go over the list, I'll go over it with you. Yeah, if you would just give me a, a summary, because I think maybe people don't know. And if you could give the summary, tell me which one of those is the most scary. And then tell me what fire does when you start burning that. Just give me the, the kind of pick the chemical picture. Well, the containers that were the, were the most concerned are the vinyl chlorides. Okay. It's a carcinogen. Uh, it has, makes toxic fumes and it's very highly flammable. Uh, this stuff boils at like eight degrees centigrade. So, you know, you had a very low boiling boiling point. You had butyl acrylate. Um, it's made for it's used it's used for making uh, adhesives. It's flammable. Uh, this causes skin and eye respiratory irritation. Stop me when some of this stuff starts sounding familiar. Uh, ethyl hexyl acrylate. Again, skin has causes skin problems, respiratory problems. Uh, can produce hazardous vapors as a noxious, uh, you know, substance. Ethylene glycol monobutyl. Um, it's acutely toxic. Uh, causes severe permanent injuries. It's highly flammable. Uh, vapors will irritate the nose, the mouth. You ingest it. You can in it, these. I'll get to that in a minute. You can ingest it. And it causes all kind of problems, including headaches and vomiting. Uh, isobutylene, dizziness and drowsing. It's an asphyxiant. Of the two, the vinyl chloride and the ethyl glycol monobutylate are chemicals that will cause cancer or attack large organs like your liver and your kidneys, things that process and filter the gunk out of our, our bodies. Um, vinyl chloride itself, when you burn it, produces two other little wonderful chemicals called hydrogen chloride and phosgene. Phosgene is a World War I CG agent used by the Germans because both um, hydrogen chloride and phosgene are, are heavier than air, so they seek low spots. During World War I, it was all trench warfare, so they'd let this phosgene go, and it would go across no man's land and go right into the, the trenches, and the people died from asphyxiation because when it got into the system and created the, the lungs and in inhalation, it would cause them to cough, choke, uh, the lungs would uh, see the irritant. It, they would fill up with water, and these people basically drowned in their own body fluids. Oh. They couldn't. You know, they, they, would, they would be asphyxiated. So you have these chemicals. However, these are all plastic chemicals. They, they, they go to make plastics. They're monomers, polymers. You know, poly, uh, vo- polyvinyl chloride is made from vinyl chlorides and all that other stuff. So when they detonated this, you had seen this big black cloud, and everyone shows a picture of it. Yeah. And what that is is incomplete combustion of all of these products. And if they're not, if you don't have something that's totally burned off, it turns into a black smoke. 
And out of that can also come dioxins, furons, formaldehydes. And when you think back to what I said earlier, this guy seeing stuff falling out of the sky into his yard, what was it? What has, what has precipitated out of these clouds, and now that we've had rain, is on the soils. And I don't hear anybody saying anything about going out and testing. This is a farm community. Yeah. If these people have dioxin, it's game over. Yeah. You know, there's a, a big fish kill off. Well, yeah, that's the uh, butyl acrylate. It says right on it, we'll kill fish and, uh, and, and algae. Uh, you know, so, so, if I'm, so oh, oh, I want to talk about the chickens in a second, but I just want to clarify. So, so there was two problems. One is what the cars were hauling. The other one was what that stuff becomes when you light it on fire, right? So you had two kind of buckets of different different contaminants. Is that correct? Exactly. Right. So, so let, let's, I, I just want to be clear about that. So then, and, and, and just to ask you, and, and, and it, and it is knowable among the people who lit those, those chemicals on fire, it would have been knowable that they were creating these new problems in so doing, wouldn't it have been known? I know if I was the hazmat chief on the scene, I would have researched every chemical, researched the threshold limit values, Every value and, and byproduct created in burning would have been known to the incident commander at the time of the incident. I have no doubt that somebody did that. If they didn't, shame on them. Uh, I, I, and, I, and, and again, no one was admitting what was going to be created when they did it until the media started reporting. Hey, is it true that when you burn vinyl chloride, you're going to create this and this? And then finally, I said, yeah, yeah, that's and, – and, you know, once again, they're not – telling the truth, telling it all, telling it first. They're like, well, yeah, you're right. You, know, you caught us. That's kind of what it looked like. Yeah, you caught us. You're right. Well, wow. That's not being truthful with the people. The no. people need to know. This. It's their town. It's their, it's their lives. Yeah. Those political people sitting there are people that they voted for and have been appointed to positions of trust. They answer to them. And like I always said, you know, when I was a fire chief, I work for the people. I don't work for the fire department. I'm just part of the fire department. You're the people that I work for. And I would always tell my guys, you know, when you dealt with the public, remember, they may be 100% wrong, but they vote. And those people are the people that are responsible for your paychecks. Be nice to them. Tell them the truth. Absolutely. Do what you need to do. I, I can and, tell you something. My my blood ran cold at hearing your description of, of what happened and how it was burned. And part of what happened is this mushroom cloud, and then, of course, it's carried away in the winds. This is a perfectly selfish question for me to ask as a Canadian, but we do rent a cottage down on Lake Erie, and I was seeing a lot of conversations on on social media about that cloud heading for, for Lake Erie. And now, like, I have concerns about that now. Can we be sure that there is not going to be contamination down there at some point? Not unless it's tested for, no. But as far as Lake Erie, depending on where you were, the, the problem that they ran into, and, and we discussed it at 27 when I was doing, 20, FMJ 27 when I was doing the color commentary, yeah. the weather guy came in and he started running the weather. Yeah. And he looks and he goes, hey, there's a 3,000-foot inversion. Now, what a 3,000 foot inversion means is if you've ever seen smokestacks and they send their puffs of smoke up into the air and it, they go out and they dissipate into like little clouds. When you have an inversion, you get exactly what you see in all the pictures. It goes up, it reaches 3,000 feet, and then it starts to go left, right, front, back, and it forms like a plate because it can't get above 3,000 feet in the atmosphere yeah. because of the temperature difference, the gradients. That inversion dropped to 1,000 feet by the evening and the winds that were coming mostly out of the Northeast heading to the Southwest did a 180 and started coming out of the Southwest heading toward the Northeast. So for a while, people in the lower part of Pennsylvania and West Virginia are getting it. But when the winds spun around that evening, all the particulate matter was being blown mostly toward Pennsylvania New York, and unfortunately, up into Canada, if you yeah. look at the aerial plumes that they have been showing. That's what I saw, so, yeah. The interestingly, matter. interestingly, our, the, the place that we rent is like five miles from Love Canal, so that like that's part of New York State is 
has yeah, really been. That's, that's, yeah, that's where it got hit. But you know, that's where it got hit. And, it, you know, and and this should be part of the the recovery portion of this. Now that the federal government has gotten involved, there has to be some kind of protocol for them to go out and systematically test for all of this stuff. Because again, we go back to the fact that this is a farm community. These people grow co- crops. There are crops that will uptake this stuff and incorporate it into their structure, rooting oh. crops like carrots, potatoes, uh, Brussels sprouts, for some reason, love to take everything in the soil and manifest itself in there. They even uptake uh, radium and they'll they'll put it into their uh, their structures. So you may get by this time, but now you're going to be going, you know, trying to buy local, you go buy somebody's carrots. Now you're re-eating the stuff that you were trying to get rid of. This is so criminal. I'm, I'm telling you, you know, I covered the Exxon Valdez up in Prince William Sound in Alaska. I was there for a month and for, for CBC Radio. And, uh, you know, the captain of the, of the Exxon Valdez, who drove it into the Bly Island Reef drunk, went to jail over it. And, and I think rightly so, given the damage. But I don't think from anybody from Exxon ever did. It never works out that way, does it? It's always the, the working people who take it. Um, I want to, I know we have a bit of, we're running out of time, but I, I want to talk to you about what we're seeing on the ground there. You know, as an animal lover, I'm also, aside from worrying about the people, I did, when I saw the dead chicken video, I, I really, I started to cry. I don't know why, I guess because they're innocent or something. I have a soft spot for chickens. But but the, the chickens that died in the video there, all they all died apparently the same time she went out to the coop in the morning and they were all dead, um, was quite far, wasn't it, from East Palestine? Am I right that she was 10 miles away from East Palestine? Is that right? Yes, but here's the thing. The odors from that were smelt as far away as near me. I live in Wethersfield Township, which is an outskirt of Youngstown. Mm-hmm. Uh, the day they did that, and you know, I told the news media, you guys are going to start getting calls tonight when the when the inversion drops down to 1,000. There's going to be people calling telling you they're smelling stuff. Yeah. At 10 o'clock, I got a phone call from someone that I knew that lived in Boardman, Ohio, saying that they smelt like pool chlorine. Wow. As you stay in your house. And then I called the news, and the news guy that I, I I know, I said, hey, and he goes, let me guess, people are starting to call you about the smells. I said, yep. And, you know, you don't know. But if you remember back at the turn of the last century, coal miners used to use canaries yeah. to find them. The canary died a lot quicker than the, the miners did because it was less tolerant. Some of these smaller animals are less tolerant to chemicals than we are you know their their threshold is a lot lower so is that what killed them or you know chickens like to scratch and eat they like to eat stones and stuff did they pick up some of the particulate that precipitated out from that cloud and eat them we don't know and the only way we're going to find out is if they took those chickens to the state you know uh, agricultural department and they did an autopsy on them and i don't know if that's going on and that's all part of the Let's examine everything and see what's going on. Yeah, I see people, they were washing residue off their cars from the fallout, Ugh. and they were using um, uh, car washes. Yeah. Car yeah. washes recycle water. Yeah. So you're putting the same water on that somebody else washed off That's their residue. Brutal. It's just brutal. It's just brutal. Um, I wanted to ask you, too, um, just – uh, uh, about the idea that some of the things we're seeing, for instance, I know that Senator Vance, J.D. Vance, was pushing a stick around in a little bit of water, a puddle, and as the under dirt was was uh, you know was moved by the stick, then you were getting these kind of they look like gas in a puddle, so so it looks like the soil is contaminated now too, and how, I don't know how this these things are so pervasive, right? There's so many elements. It's what you breathe. It's what landed on your food. It's what landed in your house. It's what it's on your skin. It's what's in the air. I mean, it's so hard to, to clean up after that. Uh, this, I'm going to ask you a hard question, but, but, but I, I actually mean it. I'm not being hyperbolic. Do you think that East Palestine might be a write-off? It's a question that, uh, I belong to the Buckeye Environmental Network, and it's a question we have we have discussed. Uh, will will it ever be clean? And I, I I can't answer that. I don't know. You know, I have not seen any data that 
that proves or disproves everybody's allegations and what's in the soil. Yeah. I don't know if we'll ever see that. But I do know that um, it's almost a form of eco-terrorism is what we've got here. Because, um, you know, if, if you explode a alpha chemical or an alpha radioactive uh, bomb at, let's say, a grocery store, you can clean that up, okay? And you could make it so that there is absolutely nothing radioactive in that store. But who's going to go into that store? Yeah. Nobody. They, if, if, if they can clean this town up, if these people want to move and go somewhere else, who's going to buy their property? So it is a form of eco-terrorism. And you know, I'm afraid that even if they manage to clean things up, which I'm speculative that they are, um, it's it's going to be hard because everyone's, oh, East Palestine. Yeah, didn't you guys have a chemical yeah. bomb? Bomber? No, I'm not going there. So there is a form of eco-terrorism there. And if they do find the digoxins and stuff like that, yeah, we're talking Love Canal, Times Beach, you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, in Love off. Canal, they moved them all back in again because everybody's looking for cheap real estate. And now they're having health effects again, right? So, so there's a lesson there. That was a super fun cleanup site. And everybody needs cheap real estate and people move back in and now they're having problems again. So, you know, talk about sacrifice zones. Maybe they should be sacrificed. Here's my last thing for you, um, Asil, and that is this. That Pete Buttigieg, who has behaved absolutely disgracefully since the beginning of this by being AWOL and saying stupid things, um, did remark the other day, oh, we have a thousand derailments a year or something in, in America if you couple that with Joe Biden saying that trains are a safer way to move hazardous stuff than pipelines are, my head's going to explode. Both things cannot be true. Um, and um, I, I just like, does anybody up there in D.C. even know what they're talking about? Or is it all just lies all the time? And the people can suffer the consequences of how dishonest they are. It's just I'm sick about this. Well, both are right and both are wrong. Trains, how do I want to phrase this? If you put a pipeline in, and, and let's, use, let's, let's use the hot button one Keystone Keystone pipeline. Yeah. Bypass, okay, was supposed to go over a portion of three states that contained a large aquifer, all right? Gone are the days when we're putting in pipelines like we did across Alaska that were made to never, ever leak, and were made to exacting specifications. Keystone Pipeline, according to what I was told, was utilizing Russian uninspected pipe that was already leaking with the parts of it that TransCanada had put in up in Canada. So if you have a leak um, over these people's aquifers, you have lost those aquifers forever. Yeah. Mm. Same thing happens with train derailments. You may have lost a town forever. So it's not a, a discussion as what is safer and what isn't. It's a discuss, discussion of how do we make sure this does not happen again? Well, I think what, it's what, also a discussion of what 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 do the people in Washington even know and understand about the problem? I think very little. My personal feeling is that we are governed by by not serious people. And on both sides of the aisle, I include every politician in this these days. And so I just I think don't, they're they they don't care. They don't think about it. Everything is a talking point. It doesn't matter. And, and whatever suits their particular moment. When don't they forget. Think, yeah. Don't forget to throw in the lobbyists as well. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Control what a lot of the politicians think. Well, and it was the lobbyists who prevented Trump from agreeing to sort out the breaking problem, too, right? Exactly. So, so exactly. yeah. So, you know, you know what? A pox on all of them. And let's pray for the people of East Palestine. I mean, it. Almost, most definitely. Those and people need it. First. They need it. And do tell them that we're, we're up here in Canada. It's a global show, but we're up here. We're thinking of them. And um, I'm going to mention East Palestine every week until it's sorted out. So there you go. Thanks very much, Sel. I'm, I'm very grateful to you. Keep on going. Thank you for your time. Okay, bye-bye. So that was Sil Caraggio, and um, he was in Youngstown, Ohio, uh, close to East Palestine, and he is a former chief at Youngstown and a hazardous materials specialist and 
the guy who really put this story on the map as it should have been, he, he's the guy who said they nuked East Palestine based on what he was seeing in that cloud of hazardous junk flying into the sky and then dispersing over people and land and animals. So that that was uh, Sill. And um, I think he's going to be uh, remembered as a hero in this. And now we're going to move on to uh, a, a guy, also a kind of hero, uh, hero, Ryan Cunningham, who weirdly is going to, he's got two roles today because he is a person who managed kind of corporate emergency management situations. He has something to say about East Palestine, but then we're going to pivot, as the comps people say, to talk a little bit about his vaccine injury, because after that, we're going to Denis uh, Rancourt to talk about a study he's done, but also he's going to talk about um, how all of these new studies coming out now that are praising lockdowns and vaccines are are flawed, which of course we knew. Um, so here is, uh, here's Ryan. Hi, Ryan. How are you? I'm doing great. You know, thanks for having me on today. Oh, happy to. So I was reading uh, your Twitter feed and saw early on you were coming out with some really detailed criticisms of how the East Palestine derailment and burn was managed from a, a kind of an emergency management corporate perspective. And and I'm just uh, wondering if you'd uh, fill us in on, on your thoughts about that. Yeah, you know, just to give the audience a background, I do. I am a hazmat technician. I have a master's degree in emergency management and disaster preparedness, specifically with dealing with high frequency and high impact events such as this. And and it's going to surprise the audience to know that you know whenever there's a release like this, the spiller, which is you know Norfolk Southern, is immediately responsible for notifying the response center at the EPA. They get you know a team on the ground and and, and then they come up and and make decisions, but what you're going to find is most of these small rural communities, you know, they don't have the emergency response resources that these big corporations do. So they activate a team of response professionals from corporate America. They come out there and, and, and they assess the situation because the, these small government entities, they, they just don't know. So what you will find often is, is that these large corporate America entities are making the decisions on how to control the release. Why is that good at times? Yeah, sure. You know, they provide a level of expertise, but they're there to protect their company first and foremost. Right. And sometimes that decision-making can be a little skewed and not always in the best interest of the residents. What do you mean by controlling, controlling the release? What does that phrase mean? Yeah. Well, I mean, they're going to want to control the narrative. They're wanting to control how the impact of, mitigating this disaster ultimately affects their bottom line as a company, right? Yeah. yeah. That, that that's, that's in the back of their mind. Why? Yes, they have their environmental obligations, but they also know that, Hey, at the end of the day, Spiller pays. Spiller is responsible for all the cleanup, all the mitigations and, and everything that's to come. And I think they short circuited this one because I think they thought by doing the controlled release, which, you know, may have been one of the only options, hey, we don't have to clean the air. We, we have no mechanisms or means to scrub the air, right? Nature does that on its own. But yeah. the more this continues to leak out into the streams, it, the more it continues to leak out in the ground, we, we've got a mess on our hands. And I think they took the easy way out, quite frankly. Why the easy way? Well, what sure. I, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't there, but taking a risk-benefit analysis, at what point in time did they make to do the controlled demolition, right? And yeah. it may have been the only option, but by burning off the material, they're not there set with a hazardous site. And let's face it, they've got a major thoroughfare of a rail line shut down. And that's impacting their bottom line. So they know if they get that burned off, they get that out of um, the containers as quickly as possible. They're no longer becomes a hazmat there on the scene. They can then open up the rail lines why they continue to mitigate and clean the rest of the area. Is that what they did? I don't know, but it seems to be that way. And, th- and that's something that there's always this delicate balance, right? You have these elitists in corporate America, and I dealt with this, that, okay, we want to do what's right for the environment. We want to get this done. But then you also have the the executives on your other shoulder saying, when's the rail line going to be opened? When's the rail line going to be opened? When's the rail line going to be opened? So you've got this th- these two different messagings that are coming out. They want to present this image that they're there for the public, 
but then they also want to present this image that they got to continue their business. And I, I think if they, if the government truly does a deep dive into this and a study into this, which funny enough in 2012, this very thing happened in um, New Jersey and when they didn't follow anything from it, by the way, but I think if the government actually dives deep down into this, they'll find that there was some competing interests and maybe the corporation made decisions that was in the best interest of the corporation. Yeah, of course they did. I mean, that's, yeah, uh, they, of course they absolutely did. I, I'm curious to know also, we just talked to Sil Caraggio, who's down there and is also a hazardous materials guy from the Youngstown, formerly chief of the Youngstown fire department. And, um, and he said that in, in the burning of this stuff, it created a secondary problem. And so if you look at the, which is the, what the combination and the, and the fire does then creates a new, a new scary product from the combustion, right? So my, I guess my question to you in this scenario is, do you think that they wouldn't have known that they were creating the secondary problem or maybe that it didn't matter because they were so keen Obviously, we can't know, but but we're so keen to to get the rail line open again and get get back to business. What what do you think? I mean, how I guess what I'm saying is, how can they be so stupid, right? Well, uh, they knew exactly what they were doing, and and let me, for the audience to know, when you're going to do things like this, th- there are programs that they have access to that you put all the chemicals that are involved, you put them all together in this program, and it will give you a modeling of what the possible reactions are of these types of these chemicals and and what it could cause. It'll even give you a trajectory. You put in the weather and and, and where it's going to go. So to say that, you know, they didn't know what was going to happen is absolutely a false statement because that is part of the job of not only, you know, the on-scene responders, but the EPA guy that's, that's there to supposed to be in charge. And then they'll coordinate that with NOAA and they'll get models and graphs. And this has been one of my my major criticisms because they evacuated a mile radius. But when they made this decision to do a controlled burn or controlled demolition, we have access to resources that they could have done reverse 911 to let people in the path and the trajectory know. They could activate the, you know, the reverse 911 system in which your cell phone goes off the same as if it's a tornado. And guess what? They had those models. They were tracking it. And Noah's pulled them off their website, by the way, by now. And they didn't notify anybody. They did this and they put the public in harm's way knowingly, even if it was the only option they had. They did nothing else to ensure that the public was protected. And they did it in secrecy and they did it in silence. And I think that's one of the biggest criticisms that I have. Even if it was a worst case scenario event, there's things that they could have done to ke- to keep people safe and get them out of the impact zone, especially during that controlled demolition, controlled burn. Yeah, that's very interesting because I did see a picture of the cloud being tracked by by NOAA, which for people who don't know is the American uh, Weather Service. Um, and then they disappeared and they stopped tracking it. And does anybody know why they did that? It just disappeared from the website, right? Yeah, it just it just disappeared. And so have a lot of the other data points that they were collecting. So. You know, the government's wow. going to have to answer for that. And it's what it does is it makes people not trust them. And it, it's they're only digging their hole even deeper at this point in the game. And, and, and I know why the residents there are upset and they have every right to be. Yeah, I, I asked uh, Syl this because I did experience this at Love Canal. Yes, I am that old, Ryan, that I covered Love Canal, but um, uh, th- that it was a sacrifice zone. And I'm I, I, I have a fear about this. I, I really, to my, the mayor, I haven't been this scared about an environmental problem in, in probably a couple of decades, right? Maybe not since Chernobyl. Um, do you think that East Palestine may be sacrificed or should be sacrificed because it's just unfixable now? Well, that could be a possibility. But whenever you go into that and you take this measured response as we, you know, make the transition into the COVID response policies, you, yeah. you have these frameworks in which, you know, you handle incidents and mitigations. And here you have this East Palestine incident in which they have a laissez-faire approach, not yeah. taking anyone's safety appropriate. And maybe that is their agenda in the background that it's, that it's going to be completely sacrificed. And they know that. But guess what? Then you have the other end of the extreme, these same entities and agencies, and they go off the other deep end. 
So it leaves you to wonder what their motives and methods are. And that yeah. could be their end goal, and and that could be what they are they're wanting to do with this, and they just wanted to sweep it under the ra- under the radar and not talk about it. Well, for me, as someone who has been reporting on COVID weekly for three years, sadly, um, and it's changed me as a person profoundly, and it's changed my relationship with the world profoundly. I honestly will say, maybe I need a holiday. But I will say it, I don't think the people in D.C., I don't even think Governor DeWine gives a shit about those people in East Palestine. I, I, I don't, they're poor, they're white, they vote for Trump, even though De, De, DeWine is a Republican. I, I think they just don't care about them. And I think they learned to not care and were exposed for not caring by the sacrifices of people that were made during COVID-19 who were victims of COVID policy, Right. They, 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 like I, there was many, many people who were harmed by lockdowns and school closures, killed by them actually, and nobody cared about them. And I feel like this is the same. These people don't fit the current narrative. They're not the current thing, right? They're not Ukraine. They're not a protected class. If they're not trans, they're not black. They're not whatever, and therefore they're they're expendable. I, I would agree with that. It's it's you got to look where that's at. That's MAGA country. That's not establishment yeah. Republican like you know the rest of part of Ohio is. And it's a shame for these people that they're dealing with this and and they have access to nobody, nothing, no resources, and nobody is showing up there for them. Frankly, yeah. if it wasn't for people like you and other independent journalists that you know were bringing this to the attention of the mainstream media, I don't know that today that they would even have the attention that they have, which is even scarier. Yeah, I'm with you. Uh, Look, I was going to drive down there, (laughs) but I still can't cross the border because I'm not vaccinated. But I I did, it did occur to me that I should probably just do what I used to do back in the day when I was young and fit and had more energy, which is go to the place, go to where the environmental disaster is. I'm so heartbroken for these people. I can't even, I can't tell you because regardless now of what happens, they're going to be afraid of their own homes. They're going to be afraid of their yards. They're going to be afraid to breathe the air in their neighborhood. And that's never, that will never change now because they've been lied to, right? 100%. They're they're being prepared reports that no one trusts now because you can go out there and throw rocks and water and watch the material come to the surface, but yet they're handing them reports saying everything's okay. I mean, yeah, it, does, it, it, it doesn't match up. Yeah, it's just it's just brutal. Well, I'll remind you, I said this to Syl, but it, it, you know, Lois Gibbs at Love Canal had to take two EPA agents hostage for an afternoon. <laughs> I'm not recommending that at all, but <laughs> but she did. They were not going to give them fair market value on their houses to get them out. So she just sort of said, "You guys stay here. We're not letting you out of my office." This little petite housewife in Love Canal. Was sort of a great moment, if I do say so. And I believe it or not, Jimmy Carter was the president then. That's how old I am. Um, so, so let's pivot. And thank you for that because um, uh, we're, you know, I think th- this is a symbolic. This is a microcosm of many of the things we've been looking at and experiencing in the last three years. So, um, and and part of that is that the legacy media was virtually ignoring it until certain people like. As I said earlier in the show, Tucker Carlson started kicking butt on it. So how awful if he hadn't, you know. Um, So let's just talk about COVID for a minute. There is a connection here, weirdly, but um, you are you actually are a direct connection. You have um, you're in heart failure. And at some point you realized it was from the vaccine. And there's an irony there, too, because you were kind of, in your own words, COVIDian at the beginning of this thing. So tell me that story. Yeah. So, I mean, early on before I, I got into the arena that I am now as an emergency man or when, when I was just doing emergency management, but I studied in that a, a pandemic and at what point in time the government would violate someone's civil liberties in the name of safety, if that's not ironic. Right. <laughs> yeah. But, right. Yeah, exactly. Wow. So it's yeah. early on in the COVID, um, sphere, you know, I was helping write many of the policies and procedures, you know, not necessarily for forced lockdowns, things like that, just to have a measured response. And I I was a proponent of the vaccine because I was going to work, you know, every single day. Um, Other people were not. It was a means to an end. It wasn't mandatory. It wasn't forced. It wasn't 
anything of that nature in the beginning. And I was one of the first to get the vaccination because I had a healthcare practitioner license as well. So within days of my second dose, I started having significant cardiac issues. And, you know, I tell this story. I I was at work as an emergency manager surrounded by fire and EMS personnel, and I I start to collapse. And I'm going in and out of consciousness, saying my last prayers. My Mm. heart is like beating out of my chest. And then I go to the hospital. And as I'm at that hospital, the the nurses are telling me that I'm like the sixth or seventh healthcare provider that they've seen have a reaction like this. Wow. And the doctors don't want to talk about it. So as I progress through my, my, my stages of, you know, what's going on, I started having increasing tachycardia incident incidents over the course of a year and a half. It, the problem is, is I ignored it. I didn't want to believe it. Right. Yeah. I didn't yeah. want to be a part of it, but that, that story, that narrative is what turned me into a freedom fighter. It turned me into going from what I was doing to doing everything in my power to stop these measured responses of the pandemic. We have plans for this. Guess what? We didn't follow a single bit of the plans of the pandemic response. In fact, in most of the public health emergency plans, guess what? They say lockdowns harm more people than hurt people, no matter the severity. And, and it, the, the measured consequences are far worse. So I, I took that passion to then become a freedom fighter. And, and uh, you know, we raised nearly a million dollars to to stop the mask mandates in Illinois against Governor J.B. Pritzker to stop the forced vaccine requirements as it relates to, you know, public health prof- or as it relates to public employees. So police officers, firefighters, teachers, things like that. And we use the, their own narratives against them. And they tried to get cr- they tried to get creative and, and, and witty and create emergency rule changes but we ultimately prevailed in court. And, and it's funny, you know, this, this is a line that sticks out for me that the, that the judge wrote in, in her order. And she said, this is the evil the law was designed to constrain. So you have these executives that yield this executive fiat and this executive power during this, and, and they became dictators and it went to their head. Yeah. And yeah. wow. we, we owe ourselves as in, in America, at least to rewrite the, um, emergency das- disaster declaration, because we've given way too much power to the executive branch just to have these ongoing disaster declarations. Well, same here, you know, up in Canada, we've got, we had them hand over our entire democracy to public health doctors, right? <laughs> With, who were very limited thinkers and whose whole focus was uh, whose whole focus was um, was suppressing the virus no matter what it's like it's like we had to destroy the village in order to save it right <laughs> They were running the country I mean it was it, it, it's madness I, I don't think we've had that kind of a of a legislative declaration here yet but um, I hope I hope we get I hope we get there soon because I never ever, want to go through this again. Um, I fear we will. I fear we will go through this again, but there you go. So let me just end. Thank you for doing this, by the way. And and let me just end by asking you, how is your health now? I mean, is, is heart failure a fixable problem or are you looking for a heart transplant or how, how, what, how does that work for you now, Ryan? So I've spent the past two months really focusing on my health and, and trying to get it back in order. And, and the heart failure is a a direct consequence of a lot of other things going on. So they're trying to fix my endocrine system, my thyroid system. And, and in the past two months that I have focused on my health, I've seen a 90% increase in my cardiac output. Um, I'm, I'm, I find it humoring because one thing it also did is it made my estrogen three times of what a woman should be and my testosterone of a hundred plus year old man. So when you see how it's been affecting hormones and, correcting those issues has, has corrected some of my cardiac outputs. And I, I'm thankful to have a good team of multifaceted providers that are, that have got me on a road to recovery. And they're saying about six months for every year I was sick, which was about two and a half years. Cause I got it when it first became available. So I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that uh, we can reverse most of these effects and, and I can be on. And the you road got to political, recovery. right? You, you got political, you, we're working what for to to um, elect a new AG in Illinois, or what? What was your focus? Yeah, correct. I mean, it, this lit such a fire under me that uh, I helped rally, <laughs> you know, 
60 plus thousand, what I call mama bears in the state of Illinois. And Mm -hmm. I ended up um, running the Illinois attorney general campaign and took my corporate America principles to a campaign. And, and just to put it into perspective, even though, you know, we lost, I'm in the deep, deep blue state of Illinois. You know, we only spent 400,000 on a statewide race when a governor spent 80 million and uh, we still beat him in votes, the Republican governor. So, well, Kind of interesting, too, that, you know, while we were talking about the Pritzkers before we started actually rolling on the interview, what awful people they are. I mean, they're just the worst. And it's it's kind of like the richest in the world now are the least moral or something. There's something really, really wrong. Absolutely. He's got every radical ideology that he's trying to use as a breeding ground in, in Illinois. And he's really coming after our kids. It's it's yeah. become It's become a whole new agenda for him. Yeah. Well, anyway, thank you very much, Ryan. I'm so very grateful that you did this. Um, Your insights on East Palestine are hugely important. And thanks for sharing your story about your, your vaccine injury as well. I'm very grateful. Yes. Thank you guys. Thanks, Ryan. Bye. So that was Ryan Cunningham. What an interesting person he is. And uh, he had lots to say about East Palestine and also He has a heart injury from the vaccine. So that's interesting. Uh, I want to throw now to Denis Rancourt, who's been waiting patiently for us to to pick him up today on the his analysis and my analysis too of these studies that are coming out saying how wonderful the government responses were. They're just garbage. I mean, it's almost laughable, except the media picks them up. So here is my interview with with Denny. We talk about that, we talk about AIDS, we talk about excess deaths, and we talk about his vaccine study, which is quite controversial. Here's Denny. Hi, Denny. How are you? I'm good. Good. I've been hoping to to speak to you for quite a while because the I, I guess the main thrust now of some of the kind of more COVIDian people working in science today is to pave the way to claim that everything they did was, was, was right. (laughs) And so as a result of that, we're seeing this kind of stream of various studies coming out, suggesting all of these remarkable things. The one I just wanted to ask you about before we get into your own work is that the, the one that suggested that misinformation was done by a Canadian, uh, that, Council of Canadian Academics or something. Misinformation yeah. killed 2,800 Canadians. I, you know, my blood boils because I know before yeah. I even open it that it's going to be garbage. Like, how do you describe information? How do you, how do you make the, the, um, the decision that that is what killed the person? Like, I mean, it's, you, you, it's something you almost can't study. It's so bizarre, right? Study with any accuracy. So let's. Well, Yes, you can study it. I mean, there's a lot of data that proves conclusively that misinformation of the propaganda that the government's been putting out has killed millions. Yeah, you know, (laughs) tens of thousands in Canada and uh, probably, you know, millions on the on the globe. So misinformation does kill the kind of misinformation that kills is the kind that is uh, created and promoted by powerful interests, by governments, by big institutions and corporations. That's misinformation, and it's very dangerous stuff. Uh, When when I give an opinion, no matter what it is on social media, that's not misinformation. That's an opinion. That's just one individual or one professional saying something that you can, you know, take it or leave it. But when the entire establishment creates this, this, this fake dangerous thing with an agenda uh, that is very serious misinformation that does cause death. No doubt about that. Yeah. It's interesting. You would put it that way because, you know, I, I respond so kind of um, almost physically when I see these things because their, their intent is clear. Um, Teresa Tam was an author on a study about, I think it was about pandemic response and it might have included vaccines that was so utterly corrupt and so much of a an attaboy, a kind of a cover your ass for her own work. I thought, how could anybody even take this seriously that she's doing a study on her own work? I mean, her own performance. It was just and of course, it was based on our old friend, Mr. Modeling. 
Um, which... Well, you know, I, I don't know about the word corrupt. What's more important to me is how obviously incorrect it was. It's just complete fabrication and just unbelievable stuff. So Teresa Tam and her co-authors concluded that if they hadn't done everything they did, about a million Canadian lives yeah. uh, would have been lost in addition. Now, that is just obscene. Uh, we, we responded to that in a scientific paper, and we showed all-cause mortality versus time, and we showed that it's a flat line. There were, there were no extra deaths until you started vaccinating, of course. But in any case, when you put on that graph uh, what uh, about a million extra deaths would look like, it's outrageous. It's like way beyond any war we've ever seen, any any disaster we've ever seen. It is it 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 more than doubles the all cause mortality of all causes in our country. I mean, it's just crazy. And um, and we argued, well, how how is it possible that all the crazy things you did, the lockdowns, the masks, the vaccines, and everything? that that brought down mortality exactly to the same point that it would have been if you hadn't done anything. <laughs> Do you see my point? Yes. Like, like yeah. how in yeah. what universe is that a likely outcome that you, you've got, you're claiming a million extra deaths here and you're claiming that everything you did and the haphazard way that you did it brought you down when you look at the actual data to something that you can barely detect by eye when you look at the graph of all cause mortality versus time. So th th this is how this is the level of so called science that we're dealing with here. This is complete insane garbage. And it's being it's being published in scientific journals that are funded by the government directly by government scientists. I mean, this is the world we're living in right now. It's, ah. it's just Crazy, crazy, it, it, crazy. It is crazy, and I'm glad you put it that way because if we it, let, let's roll forward, you know, ten years from now, right? Because what what's happening now, aside from these kind of ridiculous Council of Canadian Academics uh, pieces, um, is that the the best science, like the Cochrane science that just came out about masks, is saying they they don't work. Right. Kind of definitively, they don't work. But but then, you know, yeah. a, a smart person then rolls back and says, OK, so what about all the scientific papers that said they did? Clearly, the scientific papers that said they did were flawed and wrong. So then the next question is, how did so many papers that were flawed and wrong get published and and also taken seriously by public health. That's what this is exposing besides the actual. Well, no, they're not, they're not taking seriously to take a paper, a scientific paper seriously. You have to understand it. You have to study it. Yes. You have to yes. grasp. It. They're not doing any of that. They're cherry picking among the, 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 the garbage that's out there, the things that they put in their shopping list of, of studies that support what they want to do. That's what they do. Uh, the, the the studies that support masks are garbage studies. They're 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 field studies. They're they're prone to bias. They are not using scientific methods, the recognized methods. The, you know, there are different kinds of studies. When you're looking for a small effect, because that's that's the thing you have to understand with masking is any effect it, that it has is small. It's so small that you have to do a randomized control trial in the hope of even detecting it. And there have been dozens of these high-quality randomized control trials, and they cannot detect a statistically meaningful benefit from ma wearing a mask. Now, what I don't like about the Cochrane study is they conclude, well, we would need to do more to really be definitive about whether or not there exists a small advantage. Well, that's not the point, my friend. My fr the, the point is you've done enough of these randomized control trials that you now know that the effect must be small. In fact, you can put an upper limit on what the beneficial effect is, and it's negligible compared to everything else that, that is related to infection and death. It's completely in the noise. That's why you can't detect it after all these decades of trying. So, so please stop telling us that we need more randomized oh, control trials yeah. and start admitting that, that those trials are telling us conclusively that whatever the effect is, it's too small to be detected. 
And stop it. Stop it. You know? Yeah. But, but, but just that the line that you said that they slip in, we, you know, we see those slipped in lines in a lot of this work, right? Even work that suggests, suggests that the people, the non COVIDian people, in my view, the critically thinking people were correct. There's all, they, they, they seem to leave a little window in there to, you know, to sort of let the other side off the hook. I don't know if they do that to preserve funding or to not be ostracized by their colleagues. I, I don't know why they do it. Well, when it when it's when it's in a scientific uh, publication, uh, even the Cochrane study, there's a board of directors. There's a whole process. So there's a lot of satisfying everyone involved when you write something like that. Okay, and apparently that one took a year to get it to get it out. In oh. fact, so. So, uh, you know, there, there's always, it's always a compromise. Like w- whenever a committee has to approve a paper uh, and, and what the executive summary is going to be, it's going to be a compromise. Yeah. So it, it ends up being mush. Uh, and clear, incisive scientific thinking is just nowhere to be seen. Yeah. You know, so that that's the way it goes. Yeah. And well, it's heartbreaking that this is is what we've come to. And and let me just explain why I say that. As someone who's been doing, I keep saying this, I've been doing it for three years now, you know, delving into the science of, of COVID the best way I know how. It's come to a point where the, the, the nonsense studies, the bullshit studies, the public relations studies are the only ones that really get big attention now. And so the informational zone is flooded with stuff that makes no sense and flooded with stuff that I think a lot of smart people know is nonsense, but they let it go anyway. And what happens, just let me finish this one thing and then please jump in. The media, Mm. it's like they're designed for the media. The media is like, meh, okay, they saved lives, vaccines saved lives. It's just ridiculous. It's like a... It's like a fake little dance that science is doing on behalf of all the people who made these big mistakes. Go ahead. Well, I think we have to understand what's going on. We have to stop thinking that there is a mainstream media that is an actual media. This is a propaganda machine. Yeah, It's directed from up top. This is all entirely propaganda. And the propaganda serves huge geopolitical interests. Uh, I mean, the U.S. is at war with China now. There's a naval blockade, essentially. There's a, there's a naval presence around China that is, like, unheard of. They're talking about coming into Taiwan, putting in missiles that can reach Beijing within minutes. Uh, you know, the, 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 the Pentagon has said we're give, that they're giving themselves a decade to destroy China. Uh, they're at war in Ukraine. These are the big geopolitical things that are at play here. And if you're going to war and you're going to degrade everyone's standard of living and and completely reorganize uh, the economy, you have to have docile citizens. You have to take away their ability to communicate and organize. You have to be able to lock their bank accounts. You have to have complete surveillance of everything they do. You have to have laws in place to do all these things, and then you have to do it. So and and so you need you need and and. In addition, what, let's throw in uh, military rollouts of vaccines so we can inject any everyone on the planet with great reach with whatever we want, whenever we want. Let's let's uh, demonstrate that we can do that and let's do it. Let's put it into practice. Let's get people used to the idea that they should live in fear constantly and they can only be saved by the government's injections. And let's put that in place as well, because it, that is a Pentagon operation. Okay, uh, in the West, and so um, this is what's going on. Uh, we, we've got to stop thinking like we're still in the in the seventy in the in the fifties, sixties, seventies, and even eighties. You know, we're we're not there anymore. The 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 system has fascism has advanced to a high uh, position. Uh, the proof that there is that we're now in a fascist society is the ease with which the public accepted all of this nonsense. Yeah. The ease with which we went along, you, that is a clear sign that you that fascism has advanced, that you've destroyed the educational system, you've destroyed independent thinking, you've destroyed professional independence, and um, it, everything everything is, is a clear sign that we're in a fascist society. 
that's how I see it. Yeah, I, I think you're right. What did you mean when you said it was a Pentagon operation, though? Tell me more about that. What's your view on? Well, I I I, I believe that um, I've come to understand that uh, COVID was a um, CIA military uh, designed organized and delivered operation uh, in the Western world. And uh, China and Russia knew that they couldn't just uh, let these Western vaccines come in and, and have everyone injected. They made their own vaccines. The propaganda machine of the West is so powerful that it penetrates deeply into China and Russia. So the Chinese and Russians have to respond in a way that doesn't appear to be completely absurd. Universities have been hyper specializing people the 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 programs of studies are designed and funded by pharmaceutical industries uh all the board the board of governors of universities are people tied to those kinds of special interests and scientists are severely punished if you like if they don't toe the line if they don't publish things that that these people want to hear so you apply for funding and you apply for funding that is for a particular thing. And who, who decides what that is? Well, the highest level people at, at the government who have the, all these ties. And so you, you will only do the research that can be funded in this way, whether you're an academic or you're in, especially if you're in corporations. And so the, the entire scientific establishment has nothing to do with academic freedom, yeah. nothing to do yeah. with people searching for truth. The, 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 the oddballs that do that lose their funding and some of them get fired. And so, um, you know, there are famous cases. Uh, the, the AIDS epidemic is a famous case where you had high level scientists in Ivy League schools saying there's no such thing. And this is this is all due to uh, drug use and 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 such things. And we can explain it. And. And they lost their funding and they they were um, defamed by the mainstream media and so on. I did cover AIDS and and I know people who died of pneumocystis carini pneumonia and they weren't drug users. They weren't. So I... I no, no, I'm not. They were all drug users. No, no, no. But I did, I did not believe at the time. I, I know that there were good people who were like um, Luc Montagnier had another theory about a, a bacterial cofactor being the thing that kind of ignited the the serial conversion in people with AIDS, but, but, um, and I heard that the, the theory well, AIDS would be a whole other topic. There are entire books written about it. I know. Um, and, um, it would be a whole other topic. Um, I, I just don't think, so maybe, yeah, I mean, I, there was, I mean, I do, there was a virus and viruses killing gay men and they, it was, I mean, it, it just did have, I knew them. I was there. I experienced no. it. Right. Like I, you didn't see the virus, did you? Well, I didn't see the virus, but I knew the lifestyles of the people who were dying from it. And I mean, yeah. I'm not sure they got everything 100% right. I didn't trust Tony Fauci at all then, and I and I don't now. I think he did a lot of damage to people. But I also, I, you know, there there was something being passed between gay men having promiscuous sex. There was. And um, even though I couldn't see it, I wasn't taking samples. I know it was happening because I, I watched people die of it over a period of years, right? Like it just it was real. What else? Why else were they getting to Mrs. Kareem? Okay, I, I, I don't want to have the AIDS debate now because that's a whole other debate. I know. And you obviously have strong beliefs about it that are based on um, your observations at the yes. time and so on. Yes. And I, you know, my, my papers are not about AIDS. <laughs> Um, but I have been reading a lot about it, and I have opinions about it. But I don't want to get into an no. And you're about entitled it. to have them. Look, look at, listen to me, Denis. I think yeah. people who disagree with me are are exactly right to do so. I because I haven't read everything that ever happened during AIDS. I know what I experienced. I was reporting on it. I kind of studied at the knee of Randy Schultz, who was a really good AIDS reporter, but reasonably mainstream too. Um, so I'm not saying that you're not right, but what I'm saying is that that was not the experience of what I saw. I understand. We we develop our beliefs based on the environment that we make our observations in, and they can be strong beliefs. Um, you know, in my book, yeah. I'm, I'm just telling you, yeah. I've discussed with a lot of scientists, and I've read a lot of these papers, and my conclusion is 
and you don't have to agree with it, no. that AIDS is the best well-documented example of something that was not a transmissible disease and a, and a pandemic or epidemics. It was not that. And it is one of the clearest examples that that was complete fabrication. Um, so that's my conclusion, having looked at all these these uh, scientific papers and so on. But, you know, let's just leave it at that. We have completely different views based on completely different uh, sources of information. And let's leave it at that for the AIDS thing, because that would be another topic. And there's no, the only the only utility I see in AIDS right now yeah. is the how it contributes to the present debate. Because it, it, as far as I'm concerned, scientifically, that is hard and fast that there was no uh, spread of, 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 of a new disease. There wasn't even a new disease. They were redefining existing diseases and, and making them into this thing. And that is completely well documented. Um, so, but let's, let's, that's, that's for another day. And eventually I will write a paper about it, but, um, I think that would be for another day. Yeah. Well, I think Celia Farber's writing about that too, isn't she? I mean, she's kind of in that lane. I don't, but, but, you know, for me, it's just this, like, yeah, you're right, I didn't see the virus, but I did see gay men dying of pneumocystis pneumonia, which you don't just get, right? It doesn't just come from nowhere. There's no doubt. Yeah. There's no doubt. So then the issue is, no is, obviously, it was transmissible because it was confined to that. No, 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 no. Because gay men die doesn't mean it's transmissible. There's To demonstrate transmissivity mm -hmm. scientifically yeah. is, you know, that's a rigorous thing that you have to do. It, 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 it's very common. For example, people living in the same household all get sick. Is that because something transmitted from one to the person to the other? No, not at all. Um, um, th there, there can be something present in that environment, and they're all subjected to the same kinds of living conditions, family stress, and so on. There are all kinds of things that can cause people in the household to, to be co-infected with something similar, okay? Yeah. And, um, and, and I could just go on and on. So there, there, is, there is certainly no evidence in the scientific literature that this was ever transmitted, okay? None, none. Yeah. Uh, so, so, but that's a whole other debate. I, I, I'm surprised we went there. I, I shouldn't, maybe I shouldn't have mentioned <laughs> AIDS because it's a hot topic. Um, it is a hot but, topic. People uh, have tried to engage with me about it before. And I, I just, I, that was my experience as a journalist. And I, I know that some, because I'm a kind of a COVID skeptic, people say, well, you've got to yeah. deep dive AIDS because it was, and I'm just like, well, I, you know, I. Well, they're right. They're right, Trish. You should listen to them. I can send you a list of three or four excellent books, highly researched by scientists okay. that, that spell this out. And I'll send those to you later. Um, I am open to it. Right. I am open to it. I am open to, okay. listen, I am open from anything to, from pitch and toss to manslaughter at this point, because I am so completely flummoxed by the last three years that I've, I've had to kind of open up the guardrails about how I view lots of things in life. And as I said, I have limited, limited respect for Tony Fauci, as I did then more so now. And, um, and so send away, I, I will read it. I will. Have to read. I will. Okay, so let's move on to your study, your vaccine um, uh, injury and death study that is uh, getting yes. a lot of attention. Let's talk about that. And I, I, also, I also want to know just if you could explain for me how you crafted it to come to those conclusions, because that's kind of what we're focusing on today. Sure, sure. Well, okay, listen. Th my recent articles, we we're now into a series of articles. And um, at first, I was very skeptical. I didn't think that I'd be able to see a signal of death from the vaccine rollouts in the data. And one of the reasons I was skeptical is I found it very difficult to detect these kinds of correlations in the U.S. data. But I came to understand that the U.S. is a very special case where the mortalities in the COVID period are huge, unlike any any other Western uh, country, yeah. okay? Yeah. And I came to understand why that was, because I was finding these incredible correlations with poverty and disability and mental disability and so on. Okay, so I thought, well, I did detect examples of it 
in the U.S., for example, in the U.S., when they uh, applied a military-style so-called vaccine equity campaigns in, in many, many states, they did that. Yeah. They went to get the people who had not yet been vaccinated. Well, who were those people? They were highly vulnerable people in institutions and far away and difficult to reach and so on. And they, they, they hired all thousands of people and they went out there military style and just went and injected them all. And you can, in the injections per day, you can actually see a rise of number of injections in that period when they were applying these campaigns. Wow. Well, guess what? In exactly that period when they were applying those campaigns on the most vulnerable, there is a very significant peak in all-cause mortality that surges right then, and it's midsummer. So there is never a mortality peak in midsummer. Mortality uh, uh, seasonality is winter deaths. So it was completely anomalous. It was completely synchronous with this new vaccine rollout, vaccine equity, and it occurred only in the states that had uh, large poverty, uh, lar poverty and disability. It correlated with that. So all the, the, the southern poor states, if you like, where they applied these vaccine uh, equity campaigns, exactly where people had less been vaccinated, and all of a sudden they went and got everyone, well, there you have a summer peak of mortality. So I thought, wow, this is incredible. It, it, it's, it cannot be a coincidence. We've never seen this before. It's not a heat wave. It's, it's a broad, massive peak that coincides with this vaccine rollout. And we estimated at the time what the, the um, toxicity of the vaccine on a per-dose basis was for that case. And we found that it was higher than what we had measured in, from the VARS data. Wow. And we wrote about it in our paper about the U.S. So then I, I kind of closed the book on that. And I thought, well, that's one example in the U.S. where you can really see it. But, you know, it, it, generally it's hard to see. But then I saw some papers come out about what was happening in India. And it turns out India is a very special country in terms of all-cause mortality because in the entire COVID period, India had no detectable excess mortality. All right. On the scale of the country, there was nothing going on until their late rollout of the vaccine. Now, India is special because they they didn't start vaccinating right away they negotiated to get a vaccine where they had the rights and they could uh, manufacture it in india and so on there was all kinds of stuff going on yeah. but in the end that meant that the rollout happened months later than in most western countries and right when the rollout started they immediately went after the elderly and the people with comorbidities and the actual government policy was to vaccinate People, they had a list of 12 comorbidities, and if you had those, they were vaccinating you right away automatically. So in other words, they expressly, right at the beginning of the rollout, went after the most elderly and the most sick and the most on the edge of death. And there was a massive increase, like I've never seen before, in all-cause mortality, coincident with that rollout of the vaccine. A huge peak. So from that peak and its coincidence with the vaccine rollout, and that there had been no deaths in the entire COVID period until then, um, we concluded a, a series of a dozen arguments that there this was evidence of causality, okay? And we laid it out in our paper, and we calculated that the uh, toxicity of the injection on a per-dose basis in India during that rollout was 1% which is massive. So, so that meant that one out of every hundred doses that were given at that time caused death, okay? Um, that happened in India, and we wrote a paper about yeah. it. And then we thought, okay, that's an exceptional case. It's a massive, it's a, it's, it's a massive signal. It's undeniable. Now, um, a, some scientists said uh, that it was due to the Delta variant, Okay, that was coming out at that time. So we made a critique of that uh, alternative interpretation, and uh, I think conclusively showed that that was just nonsense. Um, so and it, but you know it's in our paper. Okay, then we uh, kept our we kept going with our work, looking at all cause mortality in various countries, and all of a sudden we saw that Australia was another one of these countries 
that had no detectable excess mortality since the beginning of the COVID pandemic. None. Zippo. It was a flat line until they rolled out the vaccine. And then you had a sudden stepwise increase, massive stepwise increase in all-cause deaths, exactly coincident with the rollout of the vaccine. And then when they had, um, I, I mean, it was the third dose, when they rolled out the third dose in the middle of a period where you normally have very little deaths seasonally in Australia, which is in the, in the Southern Hemisphere. So in, in, in the middle of um, our winter, which is their summer, which is when they don't have deaths, uh, because it's inverted in the two hemispheres, we had a, a large peak coincident with the third dose. And that the toxicity in that large peak was the same as overall for the rollout in Australia. So we proved, and we did all the states in Australia, we did all of the eight states, and we saw this phenomenon in every single one, and in all the states, and for that peak, and overall, we saw the same vaccine toxicity throughout, which is 0.05% on a per dose basis. Wow. So we had a hard number for Australia. Then we did Israel. Guess what? We, we got exactly the same number in Israel. We saw the same peaks, the same features, the same phenomenon. No deaths until you roll out the vaccine. All of a sudden, lots of deaths. And so we proved that for Israel. We went further. We said, look, in Israel, they're giving us extraordinary data. It's not only by age group, we know, uh, and by dose, um, but we've got, we've got the, the deaths by age group, but we also have the vaccine rollouts for the age group in Israel. So Israel was an exceptional case that had really good data, very detailed, made public. So we used that data and we showed that this vaccine toxicity, we call it the vaccine dose fatality rate, um, increases exponentially with age of the person being injected. That has never been seen before. It had never been discussed. Everyone had always assumed that the risk from being injected with the vaccine was independent of age, which is why they kept saying, vaccinate the most vulnerable first. Well, it turns out that the most vulnerable are people who have a risk of dying from the injection that is two orders of magnitude greater than for the younger people. See, I okay? thought I thought it would have been not that just because of the risk of heart issues in young men, yes. right? I thought that yes. they were yes. the biggest cohort because of, I don't know if it's testosterone or whatever it is. No, 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 no. Yeah, that's right. Now, let, let me explain why, yeah. how that works. Myocarditis among young men and especially athletes is very real. It's been, uh, death from the vaccine has been demonstrated in young people by a detailed op autopsy. There's, there's more and more amazing autopsy studies that are coming out that really show a, a direct causal link between being injected and dying and the, how the organs are affected in the heart in particular and so on. Yeah. Okay, that's demonstrated, but the in terms of numbers of deaths, that's a very small number. Even though you can, um, in a sense, surgically go and detect that the person died from that, and you can do it uh, when when the, when the family agrees with the autopsy and so on, the the numbers are small. But what we see is there's a deviation from the exponential for young adults. So it's higher than it should be. We do see that, but overall. Uh, the, the large coarse grain feature is it's exponential with age. And that that is just so much bigger than this relatively small effect among young adults, which is important if you're a young adult or if, you you know, and you're being injected and, it's, and, and, and you're risking all of this, it's important. But in terms of epidemiology, in terms of the numbers, it's all about age. OK, and the doubling time is is uh four years, four or five years, we, we quantified it in the paper. So that means that for every five years of age additional, you double the risk of dying from the injection. It's a huge effect. Wow. And um, we quantified that in detail in our latest paper that's been talked about in various places. So, so, so let me um, ask you this. I want to talk about where it's been talked about and what they've said, but I want to ask you this because 
I yeah. look at things sort of differently, and 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 I always look for when we talk about these studies that have big numbers of various things. What would we be looking at in the population generally at people? Right, it's not just numbers. So. So would doctors have been seeing a rise in deaths in their patients they were treating and not and would they not have wondered about it? Would they not have said, gee, the only thing that has happened differently is they got the vaccine? Like, I, I always want to know, like, how can this, it, it, it's it, like a tree yeah, falls in yeah. the forest, right? If nobody sees it, did it really happen? Yeah. And and that's what yeah. I'm trying to ask you, like, what would they have experienced on the that's ground? A great question, Trish. I understand. And it's a great question. Let me let me try to grapple with that. You see, because we're we're playing between what is observed clinically yeah. and uh, epidemiological data on the scale of a nation. Okay. So we're, we're trying to play on those two pallets and trying to figure out how do you, how do you, how do you, how do you put this together? Right. So first let me tell you that exactly what our method is. Cause that's the first question you asked me earlier on. Um, what we look at deaths by period of time over the period that they were rolling out the vaccine compared to an equal period of time just before, and then just before, and then just before. And we make a graph of those integrated deaths. And what we see is that the integrated deaths in those time periods is a constant throughout history that you have data for until you get to the vaccine rollout, then it's a stepwise significantly different amount. That's our quantification. So our only assumption is since there's that regular historic trend and the only thing that we know has happened that's different is the vaccine rollout, then the number of deaths that would occurred if there had not been a vaccine rollout mm -hmm. is, that, is that linear trend. It's that extrapolation. That's our only assumption. And that's a key assumption. Okay. And we see, when you look at the graphs, you see it very, very clearly. So, and then we, we, we make a dozen arguments as to why this is, this is a causal relationship. We, we go into the details in the scientific paper. Now, that increase that we can quantify is, an, is additional deaths in addition to all the deaths that normally occur in the entire nation in that time period. So there's people dying of a lot of different things, okay? And... Um, uh, uh, and when you're elderly and you're dying, let me put it this way. If, if you have an elderly person, you inject them, and they were already very frail, and they had all kinds of medical conditions, and they were medicated and so on, you inject them, and within a day or two or a week, they're dead. Now, what's the medical clinician going to say? He's going to say, well, we know they had a heart problem. We know that they have a history of... Uh, bacterial infections that we've been keeping under control by, by various regimes of antibiotics. We know that uh, uh, they had been depressed that time. What's the cause of death? Well, it couldn't be the vaccine. We were trying to help them. It, it probably lived longer thanks to that injection, or, or at least we removed the risk of that terrible virus coming in. So they're going to attribute a cause of death. Okay. So they're, they're going, they've got their vision of this complicated situation where their patient died. And what we say is, but if you look at the statistics, if you look at what most probably happened is that a lot of people, a lot of these elderly people died because you injected them. Okay. They would have lived a month longer, two months longer, maybe half a year, a year longer, maybe several years longer, according to our data. Now, but the, but the, but the, you know, what, what's going to be on the death certificate? Well, it's going to be what it, whatever it is going to be. Yeah. You see my yeah. point? Yeah, I do. So, so it's really, it's really interesting. So I guess, you know, your work shows something and, and certainly what we talked about at the beginning also shows something. And that is that the scientific method, the way that we determine what is demonstrably provable and demonstrably not real are now not even kind of touchstones of science anymore. That you know, we talked about this this study that was so called study that was done by the Council of Canadian Academics. It's just well, it's I mean it's not even worthy really of discussion except that it's these things are picked up by the media and they run with them. 
something that, that does not conform to the narrative is ignored by media. How do we break free from this? Well, now that's a big question. Uh, and, you know, I've, I, can, I can give you what I think. But f- first thing is there cannot be a lively and real scientific establishment if scientists are people who are put through the grinder and made to apply for grants uh, that are designed by others and superiors and are punished in that they cannot get their stuff published if they don't say the right thing and they don't get tenure if they don't say the right thing and they even get attacked in the media if they don't say the right thing in an environment like that where that's the training environment for for the scientists and for the there are no thinkers there are no thinkers okay they're just people who sought to get tenure and who sought to get research grants and who sought to publish and who sought to have a career they're careerists there are no scientists so there used to be scientists in periods of higher freedom uh, in our uh, North American society. Like after the Second World War, there was a huge period of growth and there was a lot of scientific freedom because they didn't have any choice but to let scientists organize universities because they didn't have the ability to manage all that in a, in a period of, of huge growth. I, uh, so, so there was freedom in the 50s, 60s, 70s and into the 80s, but there has been a rollback. I saw it during my own career at the university. I saw the funding uh, philosophy change from we're giving you this money to do independent research to you have to tell us that the research is going to serve industry if you want this money. There, it was explicit. It was clear. They transformed the system over decades. And I saw that transformation. Yeah. So there, there, there was more freedom before, and there is no freedom now. Um, and you're saying, well, how can we change it? Well, we can do our best to expose it like what we're doing now. But my answer would be, you're not going to change it. It's too big. The only thing that will change it is at the highest level, what happens geopolitically. Yeah. So right now, the the world is 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 there is becoming multipolar the U, us dominance is being challenged in a serious way and i mean economic and military and you name it the 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 ability of the us to project throughout the globe and to completely control and exploit latin america africa and most of asia is being diminished and the us dollar as the world currency is losing its place because Powerful nations in Eurasia are are trading um, without the U.S. dollar and are using their national currencies and so on, and they're redesigning everything so that they're not bullied and influenced by the U.S. system. Yeah. So this is this is it. This is a historic moment. It's happening now, and if we avoid really major wars, and if we get through this. Uh, Eurasia will flourish economically, as it has already demonstrated, and it will be a, a challenging system, and it'll be a challenging system intellectually, uh, creatively, uh, economically, and that will force us to find, refine again our creativity and our ability to use freedom, because freedom is the way to have invention and economic growth and we'll have to we'll have to build america and canada up again yeah uh, as being economically strong and that will that will give us a new period of some more freedom that that's the kind of thing that has to happen uh because it's a big machine and we're under the boot and it's going to be a hard battle. Well, just to bring up AIDS again, not to sort of debate it, but I will say one thing that I witnessed that kind of supports what you're saying. And that was at the AIDS conference in San Francisco, which was the last one that I attended. And uh, Luc Montagne did show up. He wanted to talk about the fact that he believed that you needed a bacterial cofactor to have the virus activated, yeah. right? And as the, they shut him they down. Shut, well, not only did they shoot him down, I mean, let's remind people he was, you know, the co founder of HIV with Robert Gallo, who kind of stole it, but that's another show. 
um, and he was treated like a pariah. I'll never forget it, watching him walk out of the building as if he just committed perjury or, 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 you know, heresy or something. I mean, it was remarkable. I thought, well, wait a minute, one guy, one minute, this guy's the hero. And the next minute they're practically escorting him out of the building. And so, so I understand very much what you're saying about that. I mean, it was really a sad day and I have to tell you, it shook me up a bit. So, well, good. Yeah. Um, We need to be shook up. We need to seriously be shaken up. Um, The, the AIDS, industry is massive yeah, I know, I know. It's, and it's global it's global and it relies on their crazy narrative yeah. and you know the, the other thing we need to realize is that the nobel prize is a political instrument oh well it seems that way now does it i'll never look at it the same way again oh it's clear <laughs> it's clear whenever, whenever they want you to accept uh one of their crazy narrative uh points they that they want to anchor to something they give they give you a nobel prize yeah. Uh, you know, wh- whether it's ozone depletion or y- you name it. The, and in medicine, it's clear as well, yeah. uh, genetics and so on. So the Nobel Prize is a completely political instrument, just like the World Health Organization is, just like all of these uh, international uh, institutions are controlled by the dominant force on the planet, which is the U.S. empire. Let's yeah. use that word, empire. You know? Well, we just, you didn't hear this part of the show, but we led with um, some people in East Palestine, or talking about East Palestine, uh, Ohio. And, you know, I mean, let's, you know, Norfolk Southern is owned by BlackRock, so that's all you need to know. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, thanks for doing this. I'm very grateful to you. Um, it's, I think it's good for us to be challenged on, on these kinds of things, and um, I'm, I'm glad you took the time to do it. My pleasure, Trish. I I see you as a true warrior, and I really appreciate your presence and your work. Thank you so much. Thank you. So that was Denis Rancourt, who is one of the hardest working uh, researchers out there. Uh, Look, I don't agree with everything he says, but um, he's a credible person, and I don't want to be like them. I want to, although I do curate my guests very, very carefully, as you all know, I get in trouble for not having more and more and more diverse opinions on than I do even. Um, but I but I think there's room for all comers, and I think you challenge them and politely, <laughs> you know, unless it's somebody in public health, and then I would be more, I would be less polite, but they never come on, so... Um, but I think that's what you do. I think we have a role to do that because there's so, I guess there's so much about it that I still don't understand. You know, I was following along a narrative I'd created in my own head about it based on what I've been reading and data and, and character judgments and that sort of thing. But I still don't think I've got it quite figured out yet. So on we go. Um, as I said, the report on the Emergencies Act has just come out. It's Friday afternoon. The Public Order Emergency Commission finds the federal government's invocation of the Emergencies Act was appropriate. Are you surprised? I mean, it couldn't actually, it's so not this, like all of the stuff that they said that they were invoking it for, most of it was made up stuff. It was made up. Right? They weren't getting crazy foreign funding from the Proud Boys. They didn't light an apartment building on fire. They weren't attacking people. They weren't Nazis. I mean, none of it was true. And yet, and yet, and yet. So I don't believe um, in these inquiries particularly. I don't. I, I don't think they are ever... They these These political... They're political. These political inquiries, they never go against the government. So that's too bad. But I want to read you something. This is a quote from Perrin Beatty, the minister who introduced the Emergencies Act. When the country is threatened by serious and dangerous situations, the decision whether to invoke emergency powers is necessarily a judgment call, or more accurately, a series of judgment calls. This is word salad, people, so buckle in. Uh, It depends not only on an assessment of the current facts of the situation, 
but even more on judgments about the direction events are in danger of moving. Oh, sorry. It depends not only on an assessment of the current facts of the situation, but even more on judgments about the direction events are in danger of moving and about how quickly the situation could deteriorate. So he's essentially saying there's nothing really bad happening, but we thought something might, which you can say about anything, right? He's a politician. Judgments have to be made, not just about what has happened or is happening, but also about what might happen. (laughs) In addition to decide about invoking exceptional measures, judgments will judgments have to be made about what the government is capable of doing without exceptional powers and on whether these capabilities are likely to be effective and sufficient. Er, So then it goes on to say, for these reasons, I have concluded that cabinet was reasonably concerned that the situation it was facing was worsening and at risk of becoming dangerous and unmanageable. There was credible and compelling evidence supporting both the subjective and objective reasonable belief in the existence of a public order emergency. The decision to invoke the act was appropriate. So democracy dies in Ottawa. I don't even want to think about how legacy media is going to play this because they were complicit in mischaracterizing and misleading everybody about what the convoy was actually about. So that's very disheartening. Very, very disheartening. Um, I'm going to end with something I received in my email inbox overnight a couple, a couple days ago. It was from Martin Kaldorf and it's um, entitled questions for a COVID commission by the Norfolk group. And it names the people in it who are the big thinkers in America on COVID and America and elsewhere, by the way. Um, Many crucial mistakes were made early on in January, February, and early March of 2020 and not corrected later. Mistakes made during this early critical window at the beginning of the pandemic affected our ability to collect data about COVID-19 and protect those most at risk and laid the groundwork for loss of public trust and confusion. These oversights led to unnecessary morbidity and mortality, particularly in nursing homes and a lack of much needed medical supplies, regents for testing and required medications. Delays in initiating research on key questions such as effectiveness of therapeutics, modes of transmission, length of infection periods, and other questions meant that policy decisions were based on assumptions rather than on solid data. To this day, many of these questions have not been adequately addressed through robust trials. So, yes. And um, this is a great document. You can find it on the website for the Norfolk Group, uh, Questions for a COVID-19 Commission. And there are a whole bunch of questions all the way through laid out really, really beautifully. So um, it kind of frames what went wrong in the pandemic for me, this document. It's something you should probably print off and keep nearby because it will remind you of what happened and how it happened. And on the note of inquiries, I was the public face of the Canadian Citizens Inquiry into COVID-19. And I stepped down from that role this week because I, as usual, was overdoing it. Um, I I just had too much stuff on the go. And I could see that uh, the requirements were getting bigger and bigger. And um, I don't like to let people down. I believe very much in what they're doing. And I support them a million, million, million and one percent. They're good people. And there are volunteers working so hard. These are the Zoom call wizards. I've never been on so many Zoom calls in my life. I mean, they're working very hard on on our behalf and to get to the truth. And listen, we know, you know, government's not going to do an inquiry into itself. That's finding a fair outcome. Look what just happened. What did I just read you? And and media also is not going to be 
objective about it because they're complicit in it, right? So do, if you're thinking about it, contribute to the National Citizens Inquiry and uh, go to their website. I'm sure they have a place there you can do it. Like I said, they're good people and they're working on our behalf. So please, if you can go see them in town, if they're in your town, be a great thing to do and follow their website for more information. So that's it for me. I just want to say, keep your eyes peeled on East Palestine. It's a bit of a microcosm of how the elites think of us all. Yeah, it's just not a good look. I'm, I'm quite worried about those people. Anyway, stay critical. See you.